This afternoon, we are with April Hoor uh, from Clone Lara, which has been uh, for Learn Life, our uh, online partner. Um, they support our learners in uh, co validating the work that they do with us at Learn Life, um, but they also have a residential and online program uh, based in Michigan. And are you in Michigan today or are you somewhere else? Remotely? I am. I'm in just outside of Ann Arbor. Yes, okay. it's, it's uh, snowy. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> which is <and> so, not good. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's lightning up here in Barcelona. We're starting to get some sunshine and warm weather. <laughs> oh, um, and so we we ended up seeking out Clone Lara originally because we needed um, uh, someone to help our learners who wanted to get a credential. And of the schools we looked at, um, most of them had an online format. They had classes, but it was very traditional. It was you know you you take math, you have to learn this, uh, these subjects, and uh, the way that your learning model is significantly different and much more aligned with ours. I wonder if you could talk to us about. Um, the fact that your learners must have had a running start with this whole thing, right? They're already mm -hmm. working remotely. They're already working in ways uh, that are transdisciplinary, that are more authentic. And so shifting context must not have been as much of a struggle. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Right. That's definitely true. So our Clonlara School has three different programs. We have a campus school, as you said. Um, we also have an online program and an off-campus program. And so our students were already, most of them, were already used to working um, remotely or in a, in a distance kind of way. Um, and for our high school kids especially, there's we have a structure and so we do require, you know, two units of math and, you know, three units of science. But within that structure and those requirements, we have a lot of flexibility for kids to do what is interesting to them and what they feel like um, will be meaningful to them. And so we want their learning to be meaningful. And so, um, they might be doing project-based learning that is very cross-curricular. Um, they can still get credit for all the different subjects, but it's not, um, their learning is not in little boxes where they do, you know, math for an hour, English for an hour, science for an hour. It's all um, intertwined. It's very, a lot of times it's very organic learning, um, depending on what their experiences are, um, what they're interested in. We really, um, encourage kids to dive deeply into interests. And so um, no one's doing the same thing. Every kid is different. Every transcript looks different. Every educational plan looks different. Um, and so when this happened and you know education changed for much of the world, our students were able to just continue doing what they had already been doing at home. They continued to learn, um, to study. Of course, you know some things have changed and moved to Zoom and, um, you know, they do volunteer hours, which you know were interrupted, but we've worked around those um, those hurdles. And for the most part, um, our kids have had a really seamless transition, and um, I think that's been reassuring for them to know that you know education, which is a big part of their life, is the same. It hasn't changed. Yeah, um, I, I think it's interesting to, as we're having our checking with our learners and the kinds of things they want to learn about, uh, this idea of uh, disciplines in a vacuum, discipline, disciplinary learning in general seems to make zero sense when you look mm -hmm. around you and you're like, oh, I have a kitchen. What can I learn about yeah. you know, science and measurements and all these things through my kitchen? Oh, I have all these plants right. that need to carry and I, need, I want to learn more about these. I want to plant a mm -hmm. garden. I want to do these things. And all of a sudden, the disciplines melt away, right? Um, mm -hmm. Right. You'd give us maybe a few examples of what is transdisciplinary looking, learning look like in, in more practical terms for your, your learners right now. What are some of the things that they're working on? Some of the, the projects you've heard about that you go, oh, wow, that's really amazing. Bravo. Yeah. Um, well, I could go on all day about things that our kids are doing. It's, it's really um, amazing the things that they come up with. And like I said, we give them a lot of flexibility to think about what is really interesting to them, what's going to be meaningful learning to them. Um, so I was just looking at some forms the other day from a, a boy, he's a senior, um, and he really is interested in um, entrepreneurship and coding and uh, web development. And he had been working on uh, a couple of apps that he was coding. And then this happened, uh, coronavirus happened. He re looked around and realized that suddenly there was a need for um, an app to help people get um, a spot on Instacart. It's like an online shipping or a shopping kind of thing, like shipped or um, Instacart. People want their groceries delivered to them, but they can't get the spot um, online. They're staying up till like midnight to try to get um, a spot for an online shipping um, appointment. And 
he realized that he could fill that need. He switched gears completely. He has spent the last three weeks coding, um, you know, madly trying to get this ready. But as I was reading his, um, you know, his learning report, he is doing all kinds of technical writing as well um, for these apps. And so that's English credit. He's coding, which is, um, you know, like a um, science um, tech credit. Um, He's had to pitch these um, apps that he's developed and try to get investors, which is speech credit. Um, and so by doing this one project, he's hitting all kinds of different um, disciplines and is able to really think about what am I learning um, you know, in, in my real life, in my real experience in these different areas. Yeah, and so uh, I, I wonder when you hear stories like this of these kids doing these wonderful high impact projects that have relevance to your life, what would you say to school leaders um, or that are, are at the moment they're sending home learners with what feels like probably to those learners uh, six hours, seven hours of homework a day? It's just here's the skill and drill exercises, here's the worksheets yeah. that you have to fill out. What, what would help change their thinking and, and, and maybe help even get them started with doing something similar to, to what you're doing? Yeah, so, I mean, I think if we can think um, more in like units or projects rather than, um, you know, 30 minutes of math and then 30 minutes of reading and then 30 minutes of science, um, that kind of hits that cross-curricular learning. Um, for instance, my daughter is in third grade, she's nine, and um, we've been talking about what are you interested in? What what would you like to learn about um, now that we're home and we have all this time? And um, one thing that we're noticing is it's you know supposed to be spring in Michigan, and so the birds are out. And so we have developed um, a plan. And um, one of our teachers at Clonlara actually um, developed a unit study, and so we're taking that unit study on birds and um, really adapting it to what she wants to do, what her interests are, what her abilities are. Um, you know, we're we've got the camera and we're taking pictures of birds and then we're going to make a little book and we're looking at websites and YouTube videos and, you know, seeing nests and going out in nature. And, um, she loves to make Google slide presentations. And so she'll make a presentation and that learning is more authentic than just sitting down in front of a worksheet about birds and filling it out because she's able to really get that practical experience of let's look outside and see what's actually happening in the world and let's see what birds live in Michigan and let's see if we can identify them and listen to their sounds. Um, and that's the kind of learning that really sticks with kids. Um, we always say that if, if learning isn't meaningful, it's not going to stick um, and it's kind of wasted time. And so if you can find things that are meaningful to the child um, and that apply to their actual lives, then that's the kind of learning that's going to be meaningful to them and stick with them for the long run. Yeah, what's been interesting to me too is that um, I, I've talked to a lot of uh, our learners in the first couple of days of the lockdown and just asked them about what their understanding of what was happening and, and, and they didn't know a lot. Um, and I think people just assume through osmosis they're going to absorb <laughs> what's happening. Um, yeah. but it's been, it's such a, um, I don't like the term teachable moment per se, because I don't want to teach anything to someone, but uh, I think it's such mm -hmm. a good moment, I guess is a better word for it, uh, to, to talk about what's happening in the world, to, to develop more of a deep understanding of what's going on. I wonder how has uh, Clone Lara responded to the fact that we're in the middle of this global pandemic that has effects in so many uh, different aspects from mental health to the healthcare system to um, the, uh, the economy and, and how we learn, mm -hmm. um, what has been, how you all have been discussing that with your learners. Well, I, I did receive an interesting message from a student um, a few weeks ago when this first started and he was, um, you know, a little worried about his plan and um, some things that he had planned to do. And he, he said, now, I think that I might be really interested at the moment to look into like immunology and some of um, the science behind how do viruses spread and that's the kind of thing that we can tell our students, yes, now is the perfect time to follow that interest. If that's something that you um, feel like you need to learn about that's relevant to you right now, um, and that's what our advisors can do is help students um, come up with ways to study things that are important to them, that are relevant to them. Um, I have a lot of seniors this year who had already um, in, in the fall plan to do projects, big projects on the voting system and the election, you know, in the US that's coming up. And so that was already 
a topic, you can kind of see those, um, what's happening in the world reflected in the kids' projects and what, um, what they're studying and interested in during that year. And so this year's a big year for, um, you know, voter issues and, um, you know, elections and how that all works. And I think we're going to see now, again, a shift in studying, you know, the economy and um, viruses and different organizations who've been involved, um, you know, all kinds of issues around what's happening that kids can study and learn from. But April, how do they just switch gears like this if they have all these exams that they need to prepare for? Well, we don't have to prepare for very many exams at all. You don't. <laughs> um, we do not. And so we have something called the full circle learning model, which helps students think through a course that they're planning or a project. Um, and it, it guides them through it and says, how are you going to know if you've reached your goals in this course? What are your goals? Um, and they could be different for every child. And rarely is it, I'm going to get a, you know, a certain percentage on tests. Um, you know, maybe it's to be able to speak with their mentor um, about this subject, to be able to, um, you know, speak well and, and feel like they know about it. However, they decide to, between them and their mentor, decide to evaluate themselves. Um, that's how they know if they have achieved goals in a course. Um, and so we don't encourage kids to take a lot of exams. Um, a lot of times it ends up being wasted time because you're, you're preparing for something very arbitrary and something that doesn't have any meaning in your real life. Um, like we said, it's kind of meaningless study. And so if kids want to go to college, then of course we can advise them on how to study for the ACT or the SAT or a college entrance exam. And, and a lot of kids do prepare for those, but otherwise um, our kids really don't have to worry about preparing for exams. They can worry about authentic learning um, that they feel like will benefit them in the long run. It's interesting. One of our co-founders was just telling us today that um, his uh, son, who is, ooh, I'm going to get this wrong. He's in like second grade, so I think he's like eight years old. Eight, probably, uh, yeah. Is is um, is reading for the first time on his own during the the lockdown. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas before at school, he hated reading. Normally, he hated reading, but now he's reading all of a sudden. And, yes. Uh, this, I think this suspicion there is when you take the pressure off of. Uh, having this um, farcical uh, exam that doesn't actually measure your intelligence and doesn't take mm -hmm. the pleasure out of it, we'll, we'll do a lot of things, we'll learn. Um, I think it says a lot seeing how uh, there's this um, underlining presupposition that learning has to happen by force or it won't happen. Uh, there mm -hmm. has to be the, the carrot or the stick. Um, and learners everywhere around the world are learning and discovering things in new ways. Um, mm -hmm. I think what's going to be really interesting is to see what happens when they go back to their schools after they've had this, however long it lasts, uh, these months to, to learn on their own and to discover. Yeah. Um, and so I, I wonder what advice you might give to, uh, to teachers working in traditional classrooms as learners are coming back and expecting or have learned so much about themselves. Um, what would what advice would you give to teachers um, in that situation where rather than go back to business as usual, what might be a next step for them? Yeah. So one thing that we really hope for all of our students at Clonlara is that they can become self-directed learners, which means they're not just sitting in a class absorbing something that someone else is telling them, but it's um, you know taking responsibility for their own learning and thinking about what they want to learn, what they need to learn, um, making a plan for that learning. And, you know, we're all learners and everything that we're doing all day is in fact learning. And so that's one thing we help students see is that your regular life is full of learning. And so how can we um, monopolize on that learning that you're already doing? And so I think when kids go back to, um, to class, the hope is that they've gotten a taste of that self-directed learning and teachers can help them, um, you know, within a curriculum that of course teachers need to use, also give a lot of freedom to students. Um, you know, if you're studying history, then give them the freedom to say, okay, what is the most interesting part of this? Or is there a person or a time period that you really want to dive into and learn more about? Um, and I think that's a way that teachers who are maybe feeling boxed in by a, by a curriculum or some sort of um, you know, standards that they have to follow can give kids the freedom to think about what is most interesting to them or what direction they would like to go 
with their learning. Um, for instance, we, you know, we require kids to learn history. If they live in the US, they learn US history. But it doesn't have to be that you know, long overview of history that you normally get in public school. It could be, um, I have students who study women's role in US history or just um, a certain part of US history or the civil rights movement or whatever is interesting to them. And even if they have this course plan that maybe is an overview, a lot of times they um, kind of change direction and say, oh, but I got so interested in this one, a part or this one person or this one facet of history that I just kind of dove into that and stayed there longer than I thought I would, which is fine for us. You know, we want them to discover those things that um, that they're really interested in and follow those things. Um, I'm glad you brought up self-directed learning because I think it's 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 interesting uh, how both of our models have it uh, as part of our DNA. You know, like that's mm -hmm. something that is part of learning life, it's part of yeah. Lara, is that that should be a goal because ultimately we don't want to develop relationships of dependency with our learners where they need us throughout their lives. They should be able right. to learn through across their lives. However, a lot of learners are coming from traditional environments. I'm sure when they come to you or when they come to us and mm -hmm. it's quite the shock to have it. Yeah. One of the, the most shocking things is not knowing what they like or what they want to learn. Yeah as on one side, but on the other side too, is there's the executive functioning part of uh, mm -hmm. time management, emotional regulation, organization, planning, all these kind of skills that mm -hmm. allow you to get things done that yes. uh, are al often um, underdeveloped or atrophied skills in a traditional environment because you don't need them. Mm -hmm. uh, right. People are telling you what to do, they're telling you how to do it, and they're telling you when to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. So you don't have to ever make those decisions for yourself. I wonder how has how has Cole and Lara confronted those challenges of, of helping learners kind of connect with what is interesting and exciting for them when they've been told all their lives, and on the other hand, how do you manage more of the the developmental part of the skill set that's uh, related to self directed learning? Yeah, that's a really common um, thing that we see. I'm thinking of a specific student that I met um, his tenth grade year, so his sophomore year of high school. He had gone to a public school um, in ninth grade, came. Um, he was he lives in Michigan and so he came to our school um, I met with him and his grandmother and his dad and he could not think of anything that was really interesting to him that he wanted to study um, that year um, very um, you know had just had a bad attitude about education in general and did not want to be there it was obvious and so his dad and his grandmother though were very committed to you know helping him walk through this process and it really is a process sometimes um, for kids to find themselves to, to think about what they like and don't like even because he had never had a choice. He, he just studied what they told him to study in school. Um, so fast forward to this year, he's a senior now, um, and they came in at the beginning of the school year and we sat down, he and his grandmother and his dad, and the change in him um, is probably the most dramatic change I've ever seen in a student ever. He was so excited about his senior project that he kept interrupting us and just couldn't stop talking about it, which was like a complete flip from his sophomore year when he didn't want to talk to me at all about anything. But he had discovered his interests um, and was so excited to follow them and pursue them. You know, he, he had a plan to, to write this book and, you know, to go through the publishing process and find an illustrator. And it was so exciting for me to see that transformation, um, you know, what's possible for a student. It doesn't happen overnight a lot of times, though. It takes time. Um, it takes a lot of reflection from the student. It takes a lot of, um, a lot, sometimes a lot of conversations between the advisor and the student. You know, what, what do we need to work on? How can we manage your time? You know, are there apps that we can use to help you, um, you know, think about how much time you're spending on your studies and how much time you're spending on, you know, video games or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so there's a lot of conversation there, a lot of relationships uh, building between the, the advisor and the family um, to provide that support. Um, and then just giving the student the freedom to try things, to fail, um, to say, no, that's not what I like, or um, to really dive deeply into something that, that they didn't expect to like. And so that's, that's a really fun um, process to watch and when when it's at the end and we get to see kids who are you know seniors and they've really thrived in this self-directed environment it's it's really great mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's wonderful to see that. Uh, we do a process uh, called 360s where at the end of each cycle, which is three months for us, we have a parent, a learning guide, another learner, and often a mentor come and then the learner presents their growth during those three months. And mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing to see the transformation, uh, especially yes. from their, their first cycle with us. And the, the you know, we bring Kleenex because you have to have the box of tissues yeah. for parents who like yes. my child to transform. They didn't know what they wanted to yes. do, they lost and now they're connecting with someone. It's, it's really powerful. Right. I think one of the things that's been hardest for our learners, even though they are learning things that are related to their passions, they're really excited about the program. I would say it's not the learning programs for us that's been difficult. It's just the emotional, um, it's the, the wellness for them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the lockdown is, is much more severe for us in Spain than it is in the U.S., but still being at mm -hmm. home with your family yes. all day, parents working, mm -hmm. wanting to help but not being able to. There's just, uh, you know, lots of parents losing jobs. There's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff happening right now, and it's a right. lot for someone to process uh, at any age, but specifically if, you, if you're a young person. Um, I'm wondering how has... Uh, Clone Lara responded to that need of, of supporting the, the well-being of, of your learners? Well, we, we always think at Clone Lara that um, connection is really important, especially for um, kids who might be learning, you know, online or at home who um, even during normal times might be missing some of the connection um, that they need, but especially now when, you know, you can't see anybody. It's just, just strange time to be um, to be doing anything. But what we have been trying to do is, is just create more opportunities for kids to connect with each other. For instance, our high school kids have an online book club and I met with them yesterday. And um, it's just, it's so good to, to see faces, even if you're not in the same um, you know space. And it's, Clonar is a global learning community. So we have kids all over the world um, and it, providing that chance to interact with kids who maybe aren't living even in the US or just have a completely different background. Um, and also at the same time, realizing that we're all experiencing the same thing. You know, we're all having this shared experience of, you know, some kind of a lockdown or isolation or, you know, stay at home and stay safe. Um, <clears throat> I think it's comforting for kids. We also have a, just a, like a language uh, group that meets once a week. And so kids all from all over the world, some kids who are trying to improve their English and some kids who are, um, you know, helping kids improve their English. Um, it's not really about that. It's about the connection. And so just that chance to make connections um, with other students, I think is especially helpful um, right now for kids to just stay mentally well. Um, of course, we have, like I said, we have advisors for all of our students, and so the advisors are reaching out to them as well. Um, we're, we always are available for Zoom calls or just checking in and say, you know, how are you doing? And, um, you know, call me or email me, you know, just having people that, that the student can connect with, I think is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Having that human contact, it's, it's mm -hmm. the kids are, are, it's funny because they're adolescents and so they're typically not prone to being cute per se, yes. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of like, I miss my friends, you yes. know, and, okay, well then how do we ha allow you to have authentic interactions where you feel like yeah. really, um, and that's been part of a really cool inviting them into design thinking processes around that. Okay, mm -hmm. well, if it's not just, because I think the first week was really cool to play Minecraft or Call yes. of Duty or whatever, like for yeah. 16 hours a day and be, you know, talking to each other the whole time. But I think that the novelty of that wore off pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> and now they're, mm -hmm. they're seeking other ways to connect in, in ways they used to. Um, that's a great, yeah. that's a great challenge. meaningful ways, right? Yeah. Um, thinking forward to hopefully sometime soon, fingers crossed, this is the, the lockdown goes away, COVID is a thing of the past, but um, yeah. I think we've learned, we've learned a lot during these months about learning. And I wonder what is your, your hope for the, the kind of um, post-lockdown, post-COVID world? What would you hope that we're able to carry into uh, education worldwide after all this is, is behind us? Well, I, I think I would go back to that idea of just self-directed learning. My hope is that students um, and teachers too would just have this taste of what does it mean to be passionate about a subject um, and to learn for the sake of learning and not just because someone is telling you that you have to learn it you know, to graduate or to move on to the next class. Um, and for students, even if they're going back to a, a really you know, rigid public school setting, I would hope that those hours that they're not in public school, which are quite a few, um, could be filled with 
lots of self-directed learning that they um, just pursue on their own because that's what that's that's the goal of every educator is to is to make these kids who eventually learn to love to learn and want to keep learning throughout their lives that's the kind of people that we need in the world and so my hope is that um, kids would get a taste for that and not see um, their learning as something that only happens in their school building with in a classroom with a teacher but it's something that can happen um, anytime and in organic ways, um, even when they don't plan it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think um, one of the things that'll be interesting is is if they start to, because a lot of our learners come from traditional settings and mm -hmm. it's like learning is a dirty word. They yes. feel like that's a <laughs> traumatic thing that's been done to them all their lives. And when they discover yeah. like, oh no, this is, this is pleasurable because it is. It's uh, it's perverse that some people don't like learning because it, mm -hmm. it releases dopamine in our brain. It's a happiness chemical. We should feel happy when we learn, but somehow we've yeah. also associated stress hormones with it often, or stress chemicals in our brain yeah. with with learning because you have the fear of the the stick, right? Um, yeah. And so it's going to be really cool to see. Uh, hopefully, schools all over the world adapting to realizing that we could we could do it differently. Yes, I hope so. I hope this yeah. is a a moment of change for us.